Welcome to Hope Church and our online service. We're grateful that you joined us today and from wherever you are gathered, we hope that you are encouraged as we spend some time in worship and hearing from God's word. There's a couple things we would just like to highlight as far as announcements. We would encourage you to go to our website, check it a couple times a week as events are constantly changing. Some service times have changed for this week because of COVID-19. And so with all the changes, going to our website, checking our Facebook page is the best way to stay up to date on changes that are taking place and on the most current information. Also, we're doing a little different format for our communion portion of our service. We have typically done it at the end of the message, but moving forward, we will be creating a separate video with, for those who want to take part with, uh, in communion. And so we'll be posting that on our website and we will also be sending out an email with more information this week. And finally, please let us know how we can be praying for you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to info at Hope Church mn.com and we have a group of people who pray through those requests on a weekly basis and so we'd be love we'd love to be praying for you this week let us know how we can do that and speaking of prayer let's go to the lord in prayer now father we thank you for who you are we thank you that you are a god uh, who remains the same yesterday today and forever And Father, in the continual summer of 2020, this summer of uncertainty, (laughs) the summer of difficulty for many people, Father, I pray that we would continually keep our eyes on you. And this morning, as we take time to gather together, to spend some time in worship, to hear from your word, I pray that our hearts would be encouraged. Father, we pray for those who are sick. Uh, We pray that you would bring healing to them. For those who are discouraged, may you, through your Holy Spirit, encourage them this morning. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are with us. And we lift up this time of worship and this time of hearing from your word to you. Come and be present among us. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2 and verse 4. And God's word says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's join together in singing our opening hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Our first scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 8. And if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to grab those, uh, read along as I read from God's word this morning. Psalm 105, verses 1 through 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Our gospel reading comes from the book of Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, and then verses 44 through 52. Reading from Matthew 13. He, that is Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Then picking up in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and come and and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he, Jesus said to to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Here ends our scripture readings for today. And once again, we just want to say thank you to those who give of their tithes and offerings to support the ministry of Hope Lutheran Church. And you can give your tithes and your offerings online or you can send them directly to the office here at Hope. And thank you for continuing to invest in God's kingdom through the giving of your offerings. As a church, we support different missionaries and ministries around the world and ministries that are also local here in the Twin Cities. And today we're going to hear from one of those ministries. It's a great ministry called Love Twin Cities. And we have a video we're going to watch to learn more about this great ministry. Several weeks ago on a Sunday evening, I felt the Lord leading me into South Minneapolis to preach the gospel with a young man that I'm discipling. I had no idea that the next day would change the whole world. George Floyd died in police custody after an officer pressed his knee into Floyd's neck for at least seven minutes. Police lined the streets throwing tear gas and non-lethal projectiles to disperse crowds. Rioters raged across Minneapolis for a third night, this time setting fire to a police precinct. Protests planned across the country today. Nearly 40 American cities. Following this protest, it's happening in downtown Seattle. It was also gathered in Chicago. The streets of Philadelphia. The tension between cops and demonstrators exploding onto Manhattan streets. It was also an ugly night in Cincinnati as people smashed windows. Looters destroyed store windows. In Denver, Colorado, a building was set on fire. In Georgia, the governor activated 500 National Guard troops. Santa Monica, California, hundreds were arrested. Killing one man last night in Detroit. I got a text.
text from a good friend of mine in New York who is a, a leader who comes into situations of racial crisis and speaks peace. A lot of people are hurting, yeah. and, and I'm one of them. I'm not numb from it. He said, I'll be in Minneapolis tomorrow. So he and I and a small team went down to where the rioting was taking place, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The city was, windows were blown out. There was graffiti everywhere. It looked like a war zone. There were crowds, thousands of, of young 15 to 25 year olds. Like sheep without a shepherd, really wanting justice and wanting answers, but really not knowing that the solution is Jesus. After having conversations with some of these young people in the middle of this apocalyptic setting, I really felt like God was saying to me, you need to build an altar right in the middle of this. So I called an emergency meeting and my team, within 24 hours, I had 30 people we formed a leadership team out of that, and then within another 24 hours, we had planted an altar to the Lord with live worship from 8 a.m. till midnight every day, worship and intercession over what was going on in our city, and then we were sending teams out, four outreaches a day, every single day for a straight week. And in that week, I got the opportunity to see God move in so many powerful ways. Many people are coming in from the community because they don't have access to groceries right now, they don't have access to personal care items, because a lot of the local businesses have been destroyed, as, as everybody knows. So maybe like three bags of groceries? Okay, I mean, what's the one? People are starting to actually find out what's going on here, so we have all of these donations, frozen goods, hamburgers, non-perishables, diapers, everything just coming in. It's absolutely amazing. I'm trying to care for people. This is the best way we know how. Once we got it all organized on the shelves, we've been packing individual bags. We have potatoes and we have eggs and meat and milk and pasta and tomato sauce and vegetables and fruit and snacks. So people are just coming up, we're loving on them, we're letting them kind of pick out clothes that they want to wear and they take for free. Um, we're just talking with people, we're sending them on inside City View Church and they are able to take home a free bag of food. So we're just connecting with people, loving on them, sharing the gospel. Really the most important part is that we pray for them and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Bye-bye. We need to share the gospel with every single person in this community and actually point them to how this is actually gonna get rebuilt. Because it's not about rebuilding buildings, putting back up structures. You know, we've done that before. The only one I've ever seen change a human heart is God. And so I think the real work, the real work of rebuilding is going one heart at a time. We all got in each other, you know, we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of love. God is love. The thing is, because God is a holy God, God hates sin, right? I gave my life to Jesus and everything changed. I haven't felt a sense of peace like this in years. It was life-changing. What do you want to leave in that water? I want to leave my whole life behind. <laughs> I want to leave my whole life behind and I want to live for God. And resurrected in a new life. Jesus is the only answer. That the gospel is the only way to bring transformation. And I feel like now is a time more than ever when the church needs to decide whether we're gonna sit in our houses and bunker down and just watch the news cycle, or whether we're gonna get out into our city and be salt and light. We believe God wants to pour out His Spirit and bring an awakening not only to our city, but to our nation and to the nations of the earth. We are asking you to pray about being part of God establishing a mission base right in the middle of where all of this started. 
We're hoping to have morning, noon, and evening worship and prayer and daily outreaches going out of our mission base in South Minneapolis, located at City View Church. So we're asking all believers everywhere to say yes. We need resources to be able to create a sustainable mission base. Thank you for taking those things to the Lord and thank you for being willing to step into the fight. We are grateful for Love Twin Cities and the impact they are having around Minneapolis, St. Paul and those communities. And we're grateful for the ways God is using them to share the gospel, to share the hope of Jesus with those who don't know him. And please remember to keep Love Twin Cities in your prayers. And let's join together in prayer as we look at God's word today. Father, now as we continue looking at Romans chapter 8, Really, this incredible chapter of scripture. I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to hear from you. Holy Spirit, I pray that we would be encouraged. Father, that we would see your grace, that we would see your love for us. So come and I pray the words that proceed from my mouth would truly give honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have you ever thought about or have you ever had the desire to be stranded on a desert island? No one else, just you, yourself, and you. Now, for those who are introverts, you you might welcome that thought. You don't like really being around people, and you're like, yeah, (laughs) I'll go to a desert island at least for a little bit of time. Others might think, man, in 2020, with everything that is going on around us, I'm sick of corona. I'm sick of all the media and the political divisiveness. So yeah, take me to that island at least until 2021. And then others might not be so sure. Well, there was a well-known pastor and he was asked, if you were stranded on an island for an indefinite amount of time, just on this desert island, and you could only bring one chapter of scripture with you, what chapter from the Bible would that be? And without hesitating, his answer was Romans chapter eight, the chapter of scripture we've been looking at for the last several weeks. Now, you really can't argue with this pastor because Romans chapter 8 is one of those incredible passages of scripture that really encompasses the heart of the gospel. And over the last two Sundays, Pastor Brian has walked us through verse 25, and we've been reminded of the freedom and the grace we have in Christ, that in Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, we have a new identity. In Christ, we've been given life through the Spirit. In Christ, we have hope. In Christ, we have the promise of redemption and eternal life. Now, this brings us to verse 26. We're going to read the rest of Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to begin by reading verses 26 through 34. So again, if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to follow along from wherever you are watching this. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. It says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. It's going to take us a little while, but we will come back to this verse, especially the all things, because I think there's a lot of questions around that. All right, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the first among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. 
Now for many believers and followers of Christ, this section of scripture is one that they find hope and comfort in, especially in the middle of life's difficult moments. Now hope is one of those words that we use a lot in church circles and hope can be a light in the darkness, in the middle of the chaos and and difficulty around us. Yet hope often carries this idea of wishful thinking. I hope things will turn around. I hope I will win the lottery. I hope my kids will be back in the classroom this fall, right? We're hoping for that. At least, at least give us a hybrid model, right? As parents, that's our hope. I hope winter will never come. That's the wishful thinking I have every summer. Now, the kind of hope we are talking about today, it is not wishful thinking. It's more than that. You see, God offers us real hope. And this hope can can help us through the most difficult times in our lives. And as we look through scripture, we see that, that real hope has a direct connection to God. Not only is God a God of hope, but he is ready to give us his hope in the middle of the problems, the difficulties, the frustrations, the uncertainties of life. And so as we close out our study on Romans chapter eight, we're going to be talking about hope filled assurances, promises and guarantees for us as believers. Now the context of Romans eight is really important. If we study Romans chapter one through seven, because of everything that is taught in those chapters, and I don't have time to give you an overview, but if you look at those chapters closely, we know that Romans eight is speaking to believers, to those who have put their hope and trust in Jesus as Lord and savior. You see outside of Christ, you will not find real and meaningful hope. So for those who do not have a relationship with Christ, it will be difficult for you to understand and experience what these last verses of Romans 8 are talking about. Because true hope, real hope is rooted. It finds its foundation in a relationship with Jesus. And for those who are followers of Christ, For those who have come to saving faith in him, these hope-filled assurances. Again, these are just not wishful thinking. No, these are realities. These are guarantees. These are promises for us as believers. So let's look at some of these hope-filled assurances. The first one is this, and we find it in verse 26. The help of the Holy Spirit, specifically when it comes to prayer. Again, verse 26 says this. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do know not, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with, for us with groanings too deep for words. Now the image that is given here is one of the Holy Spirit shouldering or carrying our burdens these burdens, these longings that we're supposed to bring to God. Now, I'm sure none of you have ever struggled when it comes to prayer. (laughs) I'm sure you have struggled, actually. Yeah, we all struggle when it comes to prayer. And we know that prayer is important. We know that we are called to pray, but sometimes it's difficult to know what or how we should approach prayer. I shared that my parents were missionaries while I was growing up and they were involved in a lot of church planting. So in the country that we were living in, they would go to these different cities and help start churches. And when I was between second and fourth grade, they were in this city and and the church that they were involved with, man, the believers there, they were just people of prayer. I mean, they got after prayer and they would have these long prayer meetings. I remember my dad telling me they'd meet at 8 p.m. to pray and sometimes they'd pray till two, three in the morning, sometimes all night till 6 a.m. And I thought, how in the world can someone do that? Have you ever wondered how a person can spend so much time in prayer? And sometimes when we pray, we know exactly what to say and what we want God to do. Sometimes when we pray, our prayers are selfish. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Sometimes we're in such a desperate situation. All we can pray is God help. God, please help me. And I think a lot of times we're hesitant to pray. 
because we're afraid that we're going to say the wrong thing. And we can so easily become discouraged when it comes to prayer. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to pray. We might think that we're going to say the wrong thing. So why bother praying? But the hope for you and me as followers of Jesus, when it comes to prayer is that we are not left alone. I love this quote I came across in a commentary and you'll see it on the screens. The frailty of our present condition hinders our prayer life. Yes, it does. <laughs> our mental horizons are severely limited compared to what God knows and wills. Yet the spirit intercedes. He prays within us, bringing our present longings to God. Now, not only does the Holy Spirit bring these longings to God, but he helps us pray according to God's will. We see that in verse 20, 27. Have you ever been in a situation in which you're like, God, I don't know what's best. I don't know what you want. I don't know what your will is. But you know what the Holy Spirit does? And scripture says that he is interceding for us. So I believe the encouragement for us as a church from these verses is let's not let fear, let's not, let's not let the, I don't know how, let's not let I'm going to make a mistake keep us from prayer. Again, we're not alone. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we can come boldly before God's throne of grace. Because we have the help of the Holy Spirit, we can pray freely from our hearts, not worrying about making a mistake. That is the hope-filled assurance we have that the Holy Spirit is beside us, helping us, encouraging us in prayer. And if I could just say this one thing, and I shared this a couple weeks ago when we were wrapping up Hebrews I think as a church, in the season that we are in right now, in our nation, in our world, we are called to be people of prayer. I think now more than ever, we need to be on our knees, coming before God's throne of grace, asking him to intervene in our nation, in our world, in our lives. And so we have a couple of prayer gatherings here at Hope, 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. I would encourage you to join us for that. If you're not able to join us during those times, please set aside some time during the week to come before God in prayer. It's what we are called to do. And we have the help of the Holy Spirit to help us as we come before God's throne of grace, bringing our longings, bringing our burdens to him. Now there's more hope. There's more promises for us as believers. I'm going to pick it up again in verse 28, our text. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. For those who are called according to his purpose, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, these verses are ones that bring great comfort and hope to believers, and they can also be easily misunderstood. So I want to make a couple things clear here in these verses. First of all, there's a couple of big words, foreknowledge, predestination, And those are topics that are easily debated, but we don't need to debate them this morning because foreknowledge and predestination speak to the plan of salvation God had in mind long before you and I were born. You see, God in his grace and his mercy, he made a decision beforehand to send Christ to rescue, to redeem, and to save us as his people. That is the heart of the gospel message. So the question people ask then around predestination is why are some saved and some not? Well, the reason why people are not saved is because of sin and unbelief. And the reason why people are saved is because of the gospel. People responding to Jesus, putting their hope and faith in him as Lord and Savior. And we leave the debate there. Now, verse 31 It is a rhetorical question. 
If God is for us, who can be against us? And this question, it demands a powerful, even defiant challenge. No one, no one. You see, if you are in Christ, God is for you. And verses 32 to 34 speak to this reality that because of what Christ has done through his life, his death, and his resurrection, for those who are in Christ, we will not be condemned. Now there is courtroom or legal language used here in these verses. Again, because of what Christ has done, God has declared the defendant, you and me, not guilty. And in Christ, we are justified, which means that we are declared free from sin and its consequences. God is for you. You see, he paid the ultimate price so that in Christ, you would be declared not guilty. So that in Christ, you would be declared free from sin. Case closed. If you're in Christ, the case is closed. You are declared not guilty. You are declared free from sin. This is the hope-filled assurance, the guarantee we have as believers in Jesus. Now, this brings us back to verse 28. It's a well-known verse. It's what we call a coffee cup verse, right? It's on several coffee cups that you find around our nation. And here it is again. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, again, this verse is for believers, right? It says those who love God. And a better way to understand that phrase, those who love God, is those who have responded to the love which God has poured out into our hearts. It's those who have said yes to Jesus and are following him. Now it says all things work together for good. And as I was studying this verse this week, I immediately thought 2020. Specifically between middle of March until end of July, where we are now. All things work together for good. Think of all that has happened in our nation and our world between March and the end of July. And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it can be difficult to see some of the good that God is working together. And so we need to understand some important realities about Romans 8.28. First of all, this verse does not say that all things are good. No, not all things are good. They're not. This verse does not, also does not imply that what happens in this fallen world, that it all comes from the hand of God. So God is the one to blame for all the injustice, the suffering, the, the frustration, the difficulty, the hardship that we go through. No, we can't blame God for that. Hardship, difficulties, frustration, COVID-19, it's all a result of living in a sinful and fallen world. Yet, and it's a big yet, and here's the hope you and I have as believers. In the middle of all of life's difficulties and trials, our all-powerful, sovereign, loving God, he remains in control over all of creation. And our all-powerful, sovereign, loving God has the power and the ability to bring Easter out of Good Friday. Our all-powerful, all-loving, sovereign God has the ability and the power to bring good out of situations that are difficult, that are dire, and that are frustrating. Does that mean that we will always see or understand the good that God is working together? Nope. The side of heaven, we will not always see or understand that. But we can know, we can trust, we can have confidence and assurance that God is at work. Remember, he is a God who is for us. He is not against us. 
at the beginning of this week, I sent out a small group, or I sent out a text to my small group. I meet with a group of guys here at Hope Church. They're all involved, and, and they've become good friends. They're guys I can just be real and honest with, guys from whom I don't have to wear the pastor hat, right? I can just be Ben, and we've had some great conversation of, around scripture and just things that are happening in our lives, and I'm grateful for these guys and their friendship. And so I sent out a text early in the week, and I said, hey, guys, I am preaching on Romans 8.20 and I need a little bit of help. And so I asked them a question and I asked them to respond. And here was the question. How have you seen God at work during COVID-19? Or what's some of the good he is working together for you and your family? And here were some of the responses I got from these men in my small group. And many of them are involved here at Hope. One said this, I've experienced peace And the real presence of Christ in my heart, especially in the middle of this storm, that is something good God is doing to experience his peace. That's good, isn't it? Here's another response. I've had more time to be in God's word and to establish good habits. It sounds like something pretty good. Another response. I've made more time. I've had more time with my family. We have every evening together and are able to engage in great conversations. Man, that's something good. And then the last one, the season has removed things that tend to distract my heart from what's most important. Even in the middle of this pandemic, God is at work. Do we always see it? No that we can have the confidence, we can have the assurance that he will work all things together for good. And for a lot of us parents, I know a big question on our minds right now, parents and students, is what is the fall going to look like? We have an announcement probably most likely coming this week from our governor and, and school districts. And I know a lot of us are wondering, is it online again? Is it some kind of hybrid model? Listen, whatever happens, Whatever the authorities decide, we can have assurance that God will be at work, that he will bring about good, whatever happens with school. Rest in that reality, especially you students, those of you in college, high school. Man, I know there's so much uncertainty. I know it can be difficult. Look, God says he can bring about good out of any and every situation. That is the hope we have. And I love what this commentary says. And again, you'll see these words on the screen. In times of trial and affliction, God has determined and decreed that he will assist us in all our necessities. I love this. Grant us patience, give us comfort, create hope, and bring everything to such an issue that we will be saved. That is how God works all things together for our good. He's at work, friends. He's at work, even in the middle of the chaos and uncertainty. Let's finish this great chapter of scripture, picking up in verse 35. This chapter closes with this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, this is an amazing hope, hope-filled hope promise and guarantee for us as believers that nothing, that word nothing, it means exactly that nothing can separate us for the love God has, or can separate us from the love God has for you and me in Christ Jesus. That is the amazing, incomprehensible love and grace God has for us. Now, there is a tenfold list mentioned here in these verses. And these are forces and realities that stand in opposition to God's purpose for us. They are forces that threatened us. But the hope and the guarantee that you and I have is that Christ has triumphed over all these forces, all these realities. You see, Jesus has won the victory. 
And that's what all of Romans 8 speaks of, that Jesus has won the victory. And because of that, nothing, again, nothing means exactly that. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Not our mistakes, not our doubts, not our fears, not our trials, not our difficulties, not our frustrations, no spiritual forces. None of that can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. So on Wednesday evening, my family and I, we, we hopped into our van. Our niece had been hanging out with us and we were taking her back to St. Paul where she lives. And as we're driving back, uh, my wife, Amy, she was looking through her phone and she was looking at Instagram. And as she was looking through her Instagram feed, she let out this gasp of, oh no. And I'm like, all right, what happened? More bad news. You're kind of used to it now in 2020, right? And what happened was, is there's this couple we've known for many years and they're a great couple. They, they love Jesus. They've been involved in a church and they were part of a young adult ministry that I led years ago. They're in their late 20s, early 30s now. And their first child was born, a boy. He was born a little over a year ago. And he was born with a major heart defect. And so this little boy has had over, he had five heart surgeries his first year of life. He just turned one a few weeks back. He was in the ICU. I mean, he had complication after complication. He never left the hospital. He never got to go home with his parents. And, and then COVID came and it just kind of threw a wrench into everything. A few weeks back, he had his fifth operation and things were looking pretty good. But then a week ago, things turned for the worst. And this little boy, he went home to heaven to be with Jesus. And as Amy was reading through the Caring Bridge site on Wednesday, as we're driving over to St. Paul, I mean, all of what I just talked about, it was running through my head. I mean, how do you even pray for this couple right now and their family? Holy Spirit, you know, what about the good God, I don't see it. I don't feel it. This, this couple doesn't feel it. But God, I'm, I'm trusting that you can work things for your good. And you know, the hope, the assurance that this young couple has is that no matter how much pain, difficulty, sorrow, anger, frustration they have to deal with in, in the weeks and the months ahead, the hope, the assurance they have, one, is that God is with them. He's walking alongside them, carrying and, and shouldering that burden and that pain for them. And they also have the assurance that because they're in Christ, nothing, no doubt, no fears, no frustration can separate them from the love God has for them. That is the hope. That is the assurance we have in Christ. And I love this summary of Romans chapter eight. And I want to close the message with this. Again, you'll see the words on the screen. Christ's death, his resurrection and exaltation at God's right hand guarantees our victory over anything and everything that would separate us from his love. When following Christ brings distress, we sometimes distant ourselves from him but Christ never draws back from us. Christ never draws back from us. That's the promise. That's the guarantee. That is the hope filled assurance you and I have as believers in Jesus, that if we're in Christ, he never draws back from us. I pray that we hold on to that truth, that we hold on to that promise as followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for this wonderful chapter of scripture that really encompasses the heart of the gospel message for each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray for those who may be watching this who do not have a relationship with you, who do not understand, who have not experienced the hope, these, these promises that are available for us in Christ, would you, through the power of the Holy Spirit in this moment, God, will you reveal yourself to them who you are? And I pray that they would respond 
and say yes to Jesus and the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, the life you offer each and every one of us. And Father, for those of us who are followers of you, God, would you help us? Help us when it comes to prayer. May we continue to be a people who, who boldly become, come before your throne of grace. God, help us to understand that in Christ, the case is closed. We are declared not guilty. We are declared free from sin. May we rest in that reality. And God, show us the good. Help us to trust that you are at work in the middle of all the chaos, all the difficulties, all the frustration. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And it's for your beautiful name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Once again, thank you for joining us and for watching our online service. Again, if you have a prayer need, we would love to pray for you and just send your prayer request to us here at Hope Church. And I want to close by sharing these words from 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Let's join together in singing our closing hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Mm -hmm.